Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nate Boswell, Assistant Dean for Stanford Continuing Studies. Thank you for joining us today for Discover Stanford for You. We're excited to bring you this event, which is being co-sponsored by Stanford Continuing Studies and by Stanford's Office of External Relations, and features two renowned Stanford researchers, David Studdart and Maya Ross and Slater. After opening remarks from Vice Provost Studdart, he and Dr. Ross and Slater will delve into the effects of introducing firearms into homes and the long-term consequences of school gun violence. With about 20 minutes left in the hour, we'll field questions from the audience and we'll prompt you to submit questions beforehand via the Q&A Zoom function. The program will, will close with comments from Megan Sweezy Fogarty, Senior Associate Vice President for Community Engagement. So to kick us off, I'd like to now introduce David Studdart, Vice Provost and Dean of Research at Stanford University, Professor of Law and Professor of Health Policy. Welcome, David, and we're gonna turn it over to you now. Thanks very much, Nate, and welcome everyone to this, to this wonderful event. Uh, on behalf of Stanford University, I'd like to officially welcome all of you and thank you for joining us. As Nate said, I'm David Studdard. I'm the Vice Provost and Dean of Research. I'm actually quite new to this role. I've been Vice Provost and Dean of Research for two weeks. So at this point, I've mastered the coffee machine in my new building, and I'm turning to other parts of the job very soon. This event was actually planned before I was appointed to my current administrative role. So really what I'm doing is joining you today in the capacity of a researcher and a faculty member. And my partner in this session, Professor Maya Rossen Slater, um, is from the Department of Health Policy and Management, which is also uh, one of my academic homes here at Stanford. Maya and I share an interest in the public health problem of gun violence. Uh, about 50,000 Americans die each year from being shot. It's the leading cause of death among young people, more than car accidents or overdoses or cancer in the United States. We come at this issue as scientists. We're both trying to unravel the causes and the social impact of gun violence. We're both data scientists and we follow the data wherever it leads. So the format for today is as Nate laid out, we're gonna spend about 12 minutes or so uh, talking about some of our recent research. I'll lead off and then, and then hand off to Maya. So let me share screen here. I hope everyone could see that, okay. All right, so um, I guess my project starts with the idea that many Americans have ready access to guns. Uh, you might have that access because you purchased and own a gun, or you might have it because you live with someone who does, uh, a spouse, a family member, a roommate. So when you think about this question of studying the risks and benefits of having a gun in the home, there's really actually an interesting question about who you should focus on. Uh, you could focus on gun owners themselves, you could focus on everyone living inside the home, or you could focus on people who don't own guns but live with people who do. Virtually all of the previous studies of the risks and benefits of guns in the home have taken one of those first two approaches. Look at that gun owner or look at the household as a whole and try to figure out what happens. In two recent studies, my team took a different tack. We zeroed in on that third group people who don't own guns, but live with others who do. About one in 10 US adults fits that description. And there is a dominant demographic feature of this group. Most of them are women. This idea of understanding the effects of my choices and behavior on the well-being of others is kind of a classic public health question. These are sometimes called secondhand risks. And the best known uh, secondhand risk in public health, of course, is environmental tobacco smoke. So understanding the risks of smoking, you know, really changed in the 1970s and 1980s when the risks that smokers created for those around them became much better understood. We wanted to bring a similar frame to the question of gun ownership. And of course, we recognized at the outset that unlike smoking, it is theoretically possible that a gun in the home may create secondhand benefits. It might, for example, reduce the risks that people who live with gun owners will be attacked or assaulted. It might be protective. The study that I'm talking about today sprang from a larger project that has been running since 2016 in my group. So I'll talk a little bit about that project and then turn to our research on secondhand risks. The larger project is called Longshot. 
and this is the Longshot team. I want to recognize them. Longshot is a cohort study, and the study is really built around the California Dealer Record of Sale database, known as DROS. DROS captures information on lawful transfers of firearms in California. It has operated for decades alongside state laws that require virtually every handgun transfer in California to be transacted through a licensed dealer. Details of those transfers, including who bought the gun and what type of gun it was, are collected in the DROS database and archived by the California Department of Justice. So this larger project was really about four years of data linkage. <laughs> we spent a long time kind of painstakingly linking records across three data sets. We started with a series of historical extracts of the California voter registration database. And to those voter registration records, we linked statewide mortality data and those DROS records on gun transactions I mentioned a moment ago. The fully joined up cohort consists of just under 29 million adults, essentially all unique registered voters in California between 2004 and 2017. Cohort members are observed for an average of about seven years and up to 12 years. 1.2 million members of this cohort uh, purchased handguns during the study period, and about 1.7 million people died during the period we were following them. Just under 14,000 died from firearm injuries. And here's a breakdown of those firearm-related deaths. About two-thirds were suicides, about 30% were homicides, and then the other categories were smaller. This is really very consistent with national data on types of firearm deaths. And on every cohort member, we collect a bunch of information, uh, mostly from the voter registration data. So to understand what we're doing in this study of secondhand risks, picture this very large group of California residents and think of them as moving through time. We're observing gun purchases and we're observing deaths. The general idea is to compare rates of gun death during the unexposed periods, represented by the green here, with rates of gun deaths during the exposed periods, so-called exposed, that's a sort of research term, and that's represented by the red. And from that comparison, of deaths in the red and, and green periods, we're going to get estimates of the risks or the benefits of firearm ownership. That's the basic intuition behind the cohort design. But of course, this is a very individualistic way of thinking about it. Many gun owners don't live alone. They live with other people, some of whom may be gun owners. So we needed to account for that in how we constructed the cohort. And we spent another year or two um, really kind of taking this group of individuals and merging them into households. So with that background on the long shot project, let me turn to our study of homicides. This was our question. What's the risk of dying by homicide for people who don't own guns, but live with people who do? And we're gonna have a comparison group and that's gonna be the rate of dying by homicide uh, among neighbors who live in handgun free homes. So we started with that entire cohort I mentioned a moment ago, split into these household structures. And then we went through a series of steps to kind of set up the comparison groups. First off, we can remove people who live on their own because this is about cohabitants. They don't have any cohabitants. Next, people living in homes where everyone is a gun owner can be put aside because we're interested in non-gun owners here. And then finally, we exclude very large households because it gets hard to track what's going on in those, in those places. So with those exclusions, we're ready to form the comparison groups for this study. Uh, and as this kind of plays out, um, what, what you can see is that the, the charcoal figures on the left represent really the group of interest for us, the people who live with handgun owners but aren't themselves owners. And the figures on the right represent the comparison group, people in gun-free homes. We can forget about the owners, they weren't the subject of our study. Uh, so when you, when you do all of that, um, you're left with about 600,000 non-owners living with handguns or living in homes with handguns, and their risk of dying by homicide is going to be compared to this other group of 16 million, 17 million people living in, in gun-free homes. Here are some descriptive statistics on those two groups. Um, time is short, so let me just uh, draw your eye to one pair of numbers here, and that's the gender breakdown in this group of interest, non-owners who live with owners. 
women outnumber men two to one here. So whatever risks or benefits we're going to identify here from the presence of the gun, it's going to fall disproportionately on women. There were about 2,300 homicides across these two groups during our study period, and about 1,500 of them were firearm homicides. So again, remember our study goal here. We want to understand if those deaths are more or less likely to occur among people living in uh, homes with guns. A measure of comparative risk is going to be the hazard ratio. Um, uh, so that's a kind of statistical measure of sort of relative risk. Um, I think for present purposes, just think about the fact that um, any hazard ratio that's above one is going to indicate higher risk for people living with handgun owners. And anything below one is going to indicate a protective effect. It's, it's, it's actually helpful in terms of mortality risk to live with uh, a gun owner. Spoiler alert, we didn't find any protective effects here. Um, virtually all of the estimates we, we, we found were really uh, higher risks for this group of interest. So let me walk through that. People living with handgun owners had more than double the risk of dying by homicide. And that elevated risk was driven primarily by higher rates of firearm homicide. That's the 2.83 here. So nearly three times the risk. When we separated homicides that occurred at the victim's home from those that occurred away from the victim's home, we saw higher rates across the board for people living with handgun owners. But the largest relative rates were for homicide in the home, as you would expect, because that's where we were observing the gun. Um, and uh, people who uh, died by firearm homicide um, again, we're, we're, we're at much, much greater risk, uh, more than four times uh, the risk. Finally, when we look within these homes, within these homicides at home, at the different relationships between uh, the perpetrators um, of, the, of the homicide and the, um, uh, and the victims, uh, uh, this is what we see. We again see higher rates of homicide across the board in every relationship category whether it's homicide at the hands of spouses and intimate partners, homicides perpetrated by other family members and friends, or homicides at the hands of strangers. The elevated risks of intimate partner homicides are particularly striking here. This is the box, the lower box on the, on the left. The overall risk is more than fourfold higher for people living with handgun owners. And again, that risk is driven entirely by higher rates of firearm homicide. To that depressing result, let me add an even more depressing final footnote. 80, 84% of the victims in those intimate partner homicides were women. So to bring all that together, uh, the key findings from this study were that a handgun in the home was not associated with lower risk of fatal assault. It was associated with higher risk and women were greatly affected, disproportionately affected. A small minority of homicides were perpetrated by strangers. That was not the most common form of homicide, but there were such homicides. But curiously, they were also more, not less likely to occur among people who lived with handgun owners. This really conflicts with a narrative, a common narrative that a gun in the home is protective and that buying a gun uh, is something that will uh, maintain security in your home. And I would just end by saying that the secondhand risks we estimated are really quite large in epidemiological terms. Um, when you look back at those studies from the 1970s and 1980s about the risks of, for example, living with a smoker, um, again, this is relative risks, living with a smoker versus not living with a smoker. The risks of contracting lung cancer um, are quite high, but the risks that we're estimating here are even higher, relatively speaking. Let me just end um, by saying that the results of this study were published um, last summer uh, in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And it was really one of a pair of studies that we published um, at the same time. The other study, which I haven't talked about today because there isn't enough time, uh, was a study that had a very similar setup uh, to the one that I've just described, except the outcome we were interested in here was suicide. And we were focused specifically on women. So among women who don't own guns, but live with someone who buys a gun, brings a gun into the home, what's their risk of suicide compared to women who live in gun-free homes? Uh, and the bottom line finding was that they were about four times 
more likely to die by firearm suicide than their neighbours living in gun-free homes. So that's my allotted time. I'm going to hand off to Maya at this point uh, and look forward to um, your questions and comments. Thanks so much, David. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Maya Rossen Slater. I'm an associate professor of health policy here at Stanford. I'm a health economist by training, um, and my work is really focused on understanding the impacts of various policies and other factors affecting families with kids in America. Um, and unfortunately, gun violence, and specifically gun violence at schools, um, is one of those important factors. So I'll be sharing some of my research on this topic with you today. So, um, you know, as I said, gun violence is uh, an important and particularly American problem. So gun violence broadly has been rising over the last couple of decades and is much higher here than in other high income countries. And um, so some estimates suggest as much as 22 times higher, although there's some debate about the exact uh, numbers and measurements of those comparisons. Gun violence at schools in particular has also followed this similar increasing trend. Um, so over the last two decades, the best data that we have available suggests that the number of shootings at schools has doubled. Um, just to give you a benchmark, in 2018-2019, the last kind of full pre-COVID academic year, more than 100,000 American students were at a school, at a K-12 uh, school that experienced an incidence of gun violence. You probably all heard about the horrific tragedy in Ovalde, Texas last year in 2022. What you may not know is that that was the 27th school shooting of 2022 alone. And remember that shooting happened in May of 2022. In 2023, we've already had 234 school shooting incidents. Um, so this is just a visual representation of some of the best data that's out there on the universe of all uh, incidents of gun violence at schools. So I'm gonna use that term rather than school shooting sometimes, in part because I think a school shooting connotates sort of this really mass um, uh, gun violent event. Um, whereas this database actually tracks the universe of all incidents in which a gun is fired on school grounds, um, regardless of sort of the consequences and the injuries or the aftermath of that. Um, and you can see it's really just increased in the last few years. It was particularly high last year in 2022, although 2023 is not far behind. Um, so when we think about school shootings, we often think about, of course, the, the, the victims and their families, and there's a lot of media attention and public discussion, um, rightfully so, um, about these tragedies. Um, but what's sometimes left out of those discussions is the fact that there's you know, several hundred thousand by now American students who were at a school in which a gun violence incident took place, but were perhaps not at all physically harmed. What happens to them, right? Um, and it's important to quantify the full costs of these events in order to inform policy discussions and to develop interventions that can help survivors. And of course, while the debate about what to do to prevent school shootings from happening in the first place is very active, is very difficult, to, is, is very heated and often difficult to influence, um, it's undeniable fact that many American kids have already experienced gun violence at schools, and so we really need to understand the full scope of impacts um, to be able to best help them. So I'm going to talk about two studies today. Uh, the, in the first, we were interested in understanding the impacts of school shootings on an important indicator of youth mental health, namely antidepressant drug use. Um, so in this study, we combined data on the exact dates and locations of 44 school shootings um, with data on the near universe of all prescriptions filled at U.S. pharmacies um, over the period of 2006 through 2015. 
This was a what's called a quasi-experimental research design. We don't have a randomized controlled trial, of course, uh, but we're essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to use observational data as best as we can to tease out causal effects. And specifically here, what we did is we compared changes in prescriptions by providers located near schools with shootings to changes in prescriptions by providers located, located slightly further away from before to after the shooting occurred. So it's perhaps easiest to see the indication of our results in this visual representation. So if you look on the left-hand panel here, what we're plotting is just the total number of antidepressant drug prescriptions to individuals under the age of 20 by month relative to the month of a school shooting occurring, focusing here specifically on fatal school shootings that resulted in at least one death. And what you see is that in the period, in the two year period before the school shooting, um, these prescription rates are sort of trending along, following kind of a slightly increasing trend. And then in the aftermath of the school shooting, you see this really deviate from that trend upwards, right? So there's an increased rate of antidepressant prescription in the two years following a school shooting, and it does not appear to be going down. Um, if you look at a comparison group of providers located slightly further away, so just 10 to 15 miles away, as opposed to just within five miles, we do not see any indication of such an increase. So if you combine um, those two facts, you can arrive at an estimate of the increase in the antidepressant prescription drug rate among uh, two kids under the age of 20 as a result of a fatal school shooting. We find that that increase is about 21.3%. If you look at over the next two year period, it's even larger if you focus um, on the three year period. And some very recent um, preliminary work that we have uh, trying to look at longer term follow up periods suggests that the persistent effect continues even if we look beyond that. Again, this is all concentrated for fatal school shootings. We do not find evidence of any statistically significant impacts of non fatal school shootings that did not have any deaths. In our follow-up paper, um, we were interested in understanding the broader impacts of gun violence at schools, not just on mental health, but on kids' later life educational and young adult economic outcomes. So to do this, we focused on the state of Texas, in large part because Texas is a, is a big state. Um, it has um, a lot of kids and a lot of schools. Um, over the time period of analysis, uh, Texas experienced 33 school shooting incidents in public schools. And Texas happens to have a fantastic linked administrative database um, tracking all public school students in the state, measuring their educational and then later young adult labor market outcomes. Again, we had a type of quasi-experimental research design. We were essentially comparing within a student changes in outcomes from before to after a shooting took place at their school, as well as for some of our long-term outcomes, which we can only observe after a shooting took place, such as high school graduation, college attendance, and so on, we were comparing cohorts. So we were looking at cohorts who happened to be at a school at a time when a school shooting took place and compared their outcomes to cohorts who were at that school four or five years earlier. And we also looked at similar differences at other Texas public, school school, public schools that have similar um, characteristics. And we looked at a range of outcomes. Um, over the short run, we focused on absenteeism, grade repetition, and disciplinary actions. Over the longer term, we looked at high school graduation, college attendance, college graduation, employment, and earnings in people's mid-20s. So starting first with the short-term outcomes, where here we're looking at the absence rate, so just the number of days a child is absent from school relative to the total number of school days in that year, chronic absenteeism, which is a term used um, you know, in education, which just indicates that a student was absent more than 10% of the school days, um, grade repetition, which just means that somebody had to repeat and grade, and then the incidence of disciplinary action. So that's going to be things like being suspended, uh, being expelled, um, or going into some kind of detention. So what we find um, doing that comparison that I was just explaining um, is that in the aftermath of a gun violence event, 
happening at a school, the rate of chronic absenteeism amongst kids goes up by about 27% in the two years following a shooting. The likelihood of having to repeat a grade more than doubles. We did not see any significant impacts on um, disciplinary actions. In the longer term, here we're doing the uh, across cohort design, right? So comparing kids who are at the actual at the school where the shooting took place in either ninth, tenth, eleventh, or twelfth grade, focusing on high schools, relative to kids. Here we're calling these as um, you know future grades, 14, 15, 16, and seventeen. These are not actual grades, right? These are just this just indicates that these kids were at the school before the shooting took place. Um, and so what we found is that there's a 3.7% reduction in the likelihood of high school graduation as a result of exposure to a shooting in grades 10 and 11, and over 15% reduction in the likelihood of obtaining a bachelor's degree. Um, we also saw a negative effect on the likelihood of going to college in the first place. Um, and then an over 13% reduction in these individuals' average earnings between the ages of 24 and 26 stemming from exposure to a gun violence incidents at their school uh, between the grades of nine and 11. So what can we learn uh, from all of these findings? Well, I think we can learn a few things. Um, first, school shootings have these very lasting impacts for the survivors, for the surviving youth. We see impacts along a wide range of margins from mental health to education to long-term economic success and well-being. Um, again, these effects persist many years later. So there's a concept of sort of resilience um, in, in psychology and, and in child development that folks often talk about when it comes to kids and trauma. Um, and while it's true, you know, that many kids can be resilient and sort of bounce back, it, it appears that at least when it comes to exposure to school shootings and exposure to gun violence, um, we're, we, we're still seeing these really adverse, large negative effects. Um, so resilience is sort of not enough. Um, you know, when I looked at the when we looked at the mental health impacts, we found that those impacts were really concentrated from exposure to fatal school shootings. However, when you look at other margins, um, so educational and economic outcomes, we see effects presence for both fatal and non-fatal shootings. Um, how do we quantify all this? Um, so one way to think about it is in terms of approximate lost lifetime earnings as a result of these negative impacts on earnings in young adulthood. And we estimate that that aggregate cost amounts to something like $5.8 billion. You know, this is just one estimate, just based on that earnings result. It does not into, take into account, for example, the impacts on mental health. And I think the final thing that I wanna note here before we go on to our discussion is that one of the things that I think this really highlights is that Whatever we're currently doing to try to help kids that have experienced gun violence at their schools, whatever current resources we're devoting to this problem are clearly not enough, right? So what we're currently doing is not enough to offset the very large negative impacts of gun violence at schools on kids' mental health, educational, and economic trajectories. So I'll stop here. Thanks, Maya. Um, Nate, I'm going to follow your lead here, but I think we get we get a right of first question or something like that with each other, right? Before we before we go to the wider group, uh, Maya, I love those studies. They're extremely um, troublesome, but just um, so elegantly executed. And every time I see you present, um, I learn something new. Um, I had a question, just a very basic question about the frequency of school shootings. Uh, what theories do we have for why these events are becoming more common? Um, particularly, I think you've made a good point about the, um, you know, some of the school shooting data mixing together a lot of different things, including kids who bring a gun to campus and 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 die by suicide, for example. But when we think about fatal events involving assaults and potentially mass shootings, I believe the data suggests that those are on the rise. Um, what is the current thinking about um, the causes of that? Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways that's the million dollar question, right? If we knew how to solve that, I think, you know, things could be a lot better. Um, so I don't know that we've sort of settled on the answer on that. You know, I, I think 
the thing to really keep in mind is that school shootings are incredibly varied in nature, right? So we often tend to think of these really mass horrific tragedies and like understanding what what makes those occur is is clearly really important. Um, but I think it's also worth pointing out that like there's just a lot of guns at schools. Um, and those guns sometimes go off. Sometimes they're going to be um, suicides that take place on school grounds. Sometimes, like in the data, we sometimes see it's a school resource officer that's mm -hmm. at the school and the gun goes off on accident, right? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe nobody's hurt even in that event, right? Like, so there's definitely a bunch of um, school shooting incidents in the data where we don't see any physical injuries or deaths. Um, mm -hmm. And yet, right, our research suggests that just sort of the, the fact that there's a gun at school and the gun goes off can have these lasting impacts on kids that we really need to be aware of and pay attention to. Um, so I didn't really answer your question of what deter what drives yeah, the increase. No, I, I, it was a rhetorical question. A tricky it's... question. Obviously, you know, I think yeah. there's people have, um, I, you know, suggestions about like problems with um uh, mental health resources to like obviously just the presence of guns um, in homes mm -hmm. and at schools. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think sort of distinguishing between these different types and sort of really understanding kind of like the difference between them. And some maybe we're just like better equipped actually at dealing with and preventing. So for example, like those school resource officer ones and whether they should be armed and so on, like that's that could be an interesting sort of policy question to consider. Yeah, yeah. And and one other, if I may, um, just thinking about your two studies, um, you know, that that very sharp increase in in uh, antidepressant use uh, close to to these these tragic events, uh, certainly a marker for uh, for mental illness and, and, and quite a powerful one. Um, but as I think about your second study and the, the long term trauma and events, in a sense, they may actually be um, uh, people that are in better shape in the sense that they've sought care and they're presumably receiving care. Um, when we think about some of those really negative uh, short and long-term outcomes in your second study, um, should we be worried about those who actually didn't show up in your in your, uh, in your your data in the first study? Yeah, you, you raise a great point, right? We're measuring mental health through mental health care treatment, right? So arguably we're only sort of capturing a very sort of small subset of actual underlying mental health issues that maybe never show up in prescription drug um, data. Um, and and yeah, and so this, the follow-up study sort of isn't restricted to only those that receive mental health care treatment, but in fact kind of looks on aggregate at all kids that are at schools. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, I think it's worth pointing out that the mechanisms behind the uh, effects on education and the economic outcomes could be varied, right? So it could be sort of a, an effect due to trauma and mental health and so on. There could also be kind of like school dynamics that amplify this, right? So it's a disruptive event. We have some evidence suggesting that teachers are more likely to leave after a year that experience that there's a shooting, right? So there's like disruption due to that and higher teacher turnover. We also mm -hmm. have some evidence that there's more um, assistant principals who are hired as a result uh, in the aftermath of a school gun violence event, perhaps indicative of like more sort of cracking down on disciplinary issues and things like that. Um, so kind of curriculums could get disrupted, resources could get diverted. So even for kids that might not be necessarily experiencing like a mental health crisis or, you know, really strong mental health impacts in the aftermath of school shooting, there could still be ways in which the fact that the school experienced one could affect their later educational trajectories. Yeah, um, I sense. guess now I get to ask you a question, right? How about it, Maya? <laughs> this is how it works. <laughs> so I have, I have two as well. Um, so first, I'll just ask the sort of the classic, um, you know, applied economist question, which is, so how do you think about kind of like accounting for other differences between households that do and do not have guns and kind of the role of those other differences? And maybe another way of sort of framing that question is, have you, um, is it possible to also look kind of like within a household before and after somebody uh, in the household purchases a gun for the first time and what happens? I mean, maybe you can't quite look at mortality risk with that design, but like injury risk and things like that. 
Yeah, we haven't done the kind of pre-post um, examinations. That's something that we're we're interested in doing. But this question of trying to understand whether people and households that acquire guns are somehow systematically different in some way uh, from our comparison households where 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 this isn't happening um, is a really, really important question. And in a cohort study, this is kind of the biggest threat, right, to to scientific um, uh, you know validity that there's some kind of systematic bias or confounding. So it's a question that we've thought a lot about. Um, and um, we've tried to kind of tackle it in a few different ways. Um, one of the things we do, uh, certainly in our studies of suicide outcomes, um, but also um, with our homicide outcomes is because we have a cohort study and we're following people over time, we can kind of look and see how these deaths uh, are distributed across the timeline after purchase. Um, and so let me take suicide as an example. Um, there is no doubt that there is a sharp spike in suicide immediately after someone purchases a gun. Um, we saw that less in our study of people who live with 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 gun buyers, but it's it's there also, um, but but much much less um, uh, visible. So so what is going on there? Probably there is a difference there, right? That, that there's there's evidence to suggest that uh, the gun was purchased because people had um, you know were going through a crisis or had intentions to to harm themselves. But as we follow the timeline out, two, three, we follow these people for 12 years or more, five, 10 years, what we see is that risk persists. Um, it's It persists long into the future. And, and so that gives us a sense that it's not just sort of reverse causation going on here. There is some sort of ambient risk associated with the presence of a gun in the home um, that's not um, directly related to the, to the uh, reasons for the original purchase. I'll also say that these studies that we did looking at um, third parties, if you like, not the gun purchaser, but the person who lives with the um, with a gun owner, that also helps us um, uh, think about um, uh, those confounders or those threats to validity uh, in, a, in a slightly different way. In the case of the suicide study, you know, it's harder to tell a story that that someone was going through a crisis and therefore their spouse went out and bought a gun. Um, you know, it's just, it's not quite as clear um, a, a kind of causal mechanism there. So, so it helps to be studying not the gun buyer himself, but rather um, who the gun buyer lives with. And, and at the same time, homicide doesn't quite work like that because it may be that you go buy a gun because you're angry at your partner or something like that and you want to end their lives. But again, if that homicide um, risk persists, you know, three, four, five, 10 years after the purchase, uh, it helps us a little bit with those causal questions. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. My other question is more kind of like conceptual, um, I guess, in nature and policy oriented. Um, so I think the gender uh, disparity that you document in terms of who the victims of uh, gun violence are in, in your data is really striking. And the, the fact that it's, you know, almost very much majority women. Um, I'm curious how you think about the intersection between your work and the work on intimate partner violence more generally. And specifically, do you know anything about like kind of interventions aimed at reducing intimate partner violence and how they sort of intersect with interventions related to gun ownership? Um, it's not my area of research. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts. Yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of work on that trying to understand, for example, um, the uh, uh, the effects of um, uh, restraining orders uh, on risks of uh, gun violence. Now, in California, uh, the um, you know the, the presence of a restraining order is grounds to remove weapons um, from a household uh, or from the uh, from the person against whom the the, the order is made. Um, in practice, that doesn't always happen, um, but there has been some research trying to understand whether the risks are lower um, in the absence of a, of a in the presence of a restraining order. Um, it's not conclusive because it's really hard research to do. Um, a lot of the time, these are illegal guns, uh, and so they're really really hard to track. Um, we haven't done intervention studies at this point. We're really trying to understand uh, kind of baseline risks. We are doing follow-on work though, trying to uh, look much more closely at kind of male female patterns of violence you know we were looking at people who live with gun owners and there are all combinations there sometimes um, two women live together and one woman goes out and buys a gun sometimes it's a mother who lives with a you know a, an older son who goes out and buys a gun so there's lots of different ways in which you know women are are the um uh 
the, the most at-risk victims in these situations. But the predominant, the archetypal situation is an intimate partner situation where um, uh, the man buys a gun, um, brings it home, uh, and, uh, and, and the woman experiences um, an assault or a homicide. So I think it's squarely in line with the intimate partner literature, um, and we'd like to get closer to some of those intervention studies. Okay, so now do we move to the general Q and A? Great. Back to me. We have some uh, some. Fa thank you both for all of uh, for sharing even so briefly uh, your fascinating research. We have a lot of great questions uh, that are coming in on the in the Q and A, and I'm going to break them. I think as quickly as I or best I can into some questions related specifically to your research, a little bit deeper probing for each of you, and then some broader questions related to policy. So we'll start. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for, 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 for submitting the questions. We'll do the best we can here. Um, David, we're going to start with you. Um, question about uh, whether or not you were able to see trends in closely related visiting or visited households, um, but not living with them. For example, a child visiting a family member uh, members home with a gun and they don't have kids and then accidentally getting a hold of gun, uh, a gun. You alluded to this earlier. Any Anything you can share there? Uh, so a few things. We were focused on adults in this study. So um, all of the victims um, that we looked at were people um, over the age of 18. Uh, and the, there's a reason for that because, you know, the, the foundation for our study was the voter registration database and you have to be 18 to be a registered voter in California. So we didn't we didn't look at, at kids deaths. We are doing a follow on. We have a, a student, a graduate student who is, is doing a follow on study now focused on children trying to understand childhood deaths in homes with and without guns um, in terms of whether this might have happened, you know, in someone else's home or um, in a in a location away from where we were observing the presence of a gun. Um, we did we did narrow on that. So in the in the tree that I showed you that talked about at home versus not at home, in those situations, we're really focused on the home um, of the gun owner. Um, so if if a if a um, if a homicide occurred in someone else's home, um, we would have said that was away from home, even though it was in a was in a domicile. So I think we can get at some of these issues um, and others we have to do more research to, to, to really get to. Very good, thank you. Um, uh, this next one is a sort of group of questions for Maya. I'll try to put them all together. Um, uh, the As it relates to, to schools in particular, has there been any research or have you done any research on uh, the effect of the school resource officer? Um, obviously, this is something that is discussed uh, broadly uh, and often we hear it in the media and beyond. Um, but I want to know if there are any findings uh, about how, if and how school resource officers deter gun usage at school. Um, I, I guess related to that is the issue of meta, metal detectors and these kinds of preventive, per, perceived preventative measures. Um, wondering if you can talk a little bit about that just as it relates to your research. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Those are great questions. Um, so I think the bottom line is I don't think we have great evidence on any of those, right? Which is kind of interesting because these have largely been the big responses, especially in the aftermath of really big shootings. So one thing that I can tell you is like we looked at data on school shooting drills, um, which is kind of in line with this uh, with this um, set of responses um, for the state of Florida. And in the aftermath of the Parklet shooting, like the frequency with which schools are doing these drills has really increased. Um, and in some cases, these are drills, for example, where the kids don't know it's a drill until after the fact and sort of some pretty, um, pretty intense experiences. Um, and unfortunately, as far as I know, we currently don't have any good kind of causal evidence on the effectiveness of these types of interventions or on things like school resource officers, metal detectors, et cetera. Um, that's an active area of work. I know of some folks that are trying to make some uh, progress on these questions. Uh, the data is a bit hard to come by. Um, we just don't have like great, you know, there've been 
lots of folks working really hard at collecting really comprehensive information on actual gun violence incidents, right? So that's the data that we use um, in our studies. The data on these types of policy responses um, is, is sort of a district by district kind of thing. Um, and so it's really hard to kind of gather it on a systematic level. Um, but, you know, I know some folks that have been trying to do that. Um, and so I hopefully we'll know more in the coming years. Um, but at the moment, I don't think we have great evidence on the effectiveness of these interventions. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, there are a lot of questions asking about how you both get the word out or, or communicate the results of your research in various ways. Um, and so uh, some of them, it's just, uh, you know, how do you get the message that having a gun in the home is not protective? Where does that get communicated to? How does that information get out? And then, uh, uh, well, well, let's just start with that one and we can we can take it from there. So I guess that's for either one of you. Or both. Well, I think Maya and I are pretty active in getting out and talking about our research and not just to our scientific colleagues. You know, we try to come to fora like this to to spread the word and and, and let people know what we're doing. Um, but the truth is, Nate, that's not enough. You know, we, we, we need to reach a much larger audience than that. And and I tend to think that there are people that are better at doing this than we are. <laughs> So there are a number of groups, actually, and many of them have sprung up in the last decade in the wake of Sandy Hook, that um, really, um, this is their business. They're nonprofits that um, that try to take, they do a lot of advocacy and they take scientific research and kind of use it for um, for the town halls and the, and the promotional material and the other things that they do. And so, you know, we're in touch with some of those um, uh, organizations like Everytown and, and Giffords, and, and, and they're actually really avid consumers of this kind of research. Um, and I think of that as, as, as quite a nice partnership, actually. Some of them I would categorize as much more activist and, and kind of preordained in their views, maybe, than Maya and I are. But, you know, we're happy for anyone uh, to take our research uh, and, and use it, uh, hopefully faithfully, uh, to, to get the word out. Yeah, um, I don't have much to add. I think David really summarized the process quite well. We try to talk as much as we can to other organizations, to the media, um, and so on. Um, but yeah, ultimately, um, you know, we do hope that this research is obviously useful for actual policy making. There are also some questions, and maybe this is something that uh, we we handle afterwards. There's some questions about how to uh, how to partner with you two. <laughs> in some way so for organizations in the community uh sharing your, your 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 work with them or communicating with them i don't know if you can speak very quickly uh to that um before we get into some more some more uh broad questions i mean we're easy to find and uh you know if people have an interest in in this work um especially if they have an interest in funding this kind of work we'd love to hear from them yep agreed yeah always happy to you know chat to anybody who's interested in learning more. Okay. And a reminder to our audience that this uh, um, presentation, the video of the presentation will be available afterwards to look at. And so um, uh, hopefully that, that will help help give ideas and answer some of those questions. Another research question um, about the homicide statistics um, in the home. Um, do they include factors in, involving uh, improper firearm storage? Uh, so easier access. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that question was uh, approached? Yeah, I mean, we don't observe that. We, we in our data, we don't have the ability to try to understand whether guns were stored um, uh, safely, uh, unlocked, um, locked, unlocked, loaded, unloaded. We we just don't have the information to say that. There is other research suggesting that. Um, those measures can have um, a pretty significant impact on uh, certain kinds of gun deaths, particularly youth suicide um, when kids get access to the guns. For homicide, there isn't really evidence um, that uh, that safe storage um, helps or hurts. Um, and I think intuitively, um, it's it's not clear why it would. You know, if a gun owner 
locks their gun away in the home um, or doesn't lock their gun away in the home, um, they still have access to it, uh, one would assume. Now, what it might do in a moment of kind of passion between um, uh, intimate partners, for example, um, when tempers flare, it may slow things down a little bit, um, but I, you know, I think that would be a very hard uh, effect to try to measure. If we did have that variable though, Nate, we would love to use it. And I think we would be most interested in using it in our studies, examining suicide uh, and studying accidental gun deaths among, among kids. One of the uh, rather stark findings um, is the uh, the increased likelihood that women are going to uh, be affected by gun violence in, in the study. Um, from a policy perspective, uh, how can household risk data be leveraged to impact policy and further protect women in particular uh, at risk with guns in their household? Yeah, I mean, I think this is sort of like a, I think of it as a sort of a silent mainstream out there, right? You know, like men are the predominant buyers of firearms, not exclusively, but predominantly. Um, and actually white men are, are the predominant buyers of guns. Uh, gun purchasing rates among minorities are, you know, relatively low. Um, you know, when I think about the constituency for this work, um, policymakers, nonprofits, and, um, uh, you know, legislators, they're all relevant and we hope our work speaks to them. But for the work that we're doing on the Longshot Project, our real constituency, I feel like, is people who own guns uh, or people who are thinking about buying guns. Um, and, you know, most of those people are regular people who just want to like protect their families like 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 all of us they they care about their families and they want them to be safe uh, and there is a narrative out there uh, that having a gun in the home um, is is protective and you can see why that's an appealing and intuitive narrative especially for people who live in bad neighborhoods for example um, but the evidence really just does not does not support that. Um, so the fact that 70% of people who buy handguns say the leading reason for doing it is personal security and safety of their families. Um, you know, I think it's important um, to, to push against that um, and, and point out that, you know, on average uh, at the population level, it's just not um, protective. Uh, it's much more likely that the gun will fall into the hands of um, uh, someone who, who shouldn't use it or uh, a kid in the household or a visitor in the household or um, even the gun buyer, him or herself, um, in a moment of um, uh, you know uh, passion or or, um, or weakness or something. Thank you. Um, and and for Maya, a related question um, from a policy perspective, um, from where you sit as a researcher, are there specific things other than what you've already touched on that can be done to reduce the number of school shootings? Uh, a lot of questions about. Obviously, it's it, it, it's it's terrifying. Um, wondering if you can offer policy suggestions there. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I will say, like, our research doesn't actually speak to that, right? So we're not interested. We're not able to estimate like the effects of factors on the incidence of school shootings. We're rather tracking the consequences. So let me just first state a, a sort of a policy implication of that, and then I can speak on the first question. Um, so one thing is that if you think about like just the fact that many kids have already experienced gun violence and you know they're now adolescents and young adults and so on and they're continuing to live with this what can we do for them or what can we do for the unfortunate inevitable future at least in, in the immediate future that these events are going to continue happening um so there we can actually look to other places right what what do we learn from other places um so one example um is norway Okay, the country of Norway, where they experienced um, a horrific mass shooting event in 2011 in Utoya. Um, and one of the things that's sort of interesting is that when you look at the magnitudes of the effects of um, exposure to gun violence at schools in the state of Texas on um, kids' long run outcomes like educational attainment and earnings, the magnitudes of those effect sizes are actually similar to what has been found for the families and friends of the victims of the Norwegian mass shooting. Okay, 
and like many differences between the state of Texas and the country of Norway. Um, but one thing that's worth pointing out is that the Norway had a massive response to this horrible tragedy, right? In terms of like financial resources directed to so not just sort of survivors and direct family, but like whole neighborhoods and schools and so on, um, as well as like access to mental health care, like, you know, really quite immediately and over the long term. To the best of my knowledge, the US, despite the, you know, the increasing frequency with which these types of events take place, we don't have any kind of systematic federal level response of this type um, or state level um, or sort of local level. Um, and so I think kind of as a first point, before we even get to the question of like what to do to prevent school shootings, which is obviously a critical question, um, we also got to reckon with the fact that many have already taken place, right? And maybe we haven't done enough um, in that aftermath. Um, so that's kind of my first policy point. On the bigger question of like what to do to prevent them, again, like I can't speak to that from like a research perspective. I can like share an opinion that I might have. Um, but I guess one thing again, I'll point out is what I said earlier to David is like, there's a lot of different things that are school shootings. There's just a lot of guns that are out there that end up being in schools. So I think that it really intersects with the things that David was talking about, like guns and homes can then be guns in schools. Um, and so uh, thinking about that problem as a whole um, seems really relevant. Yeah, Maya, I had a student this summer working on a very narrow question, which was among sort of 120 school shootings over the last 15 years. Um, what was the source of the weapon um, that the that the child used? We looked at only shootings that involved students at the school, and the overwhelming majority um, of the sources, as you might imagine, are the home of the shooter and a parent um, of the shooter. So, you know, it makes one think about these child access prevention laws and safe storage laws that really try to um, encourage families to be thoughtful about storage. Thank you. Uh, uh, as we were, we're running low on time and there's so many questions, it's impossible to get to all of them. Um, I, I do have an anecdote uh, uh, to, to share from one of the uh, uh, audience who, um, before I turn it over to Megan to, to, to close us up with great appreciation to you both. Um, one of our uh, guests has said, I am a, tra a retired trauma surgeon and have treated hundreds of gunshot wounds over the past several decades. The vast majority of gunshot victims I have treated were shot either by themselves or by someone they knew. I've almost never seen someone shot by a legitimate gun, gun owner protecting themselves or their property. Um, gun ownership does not make people safer, exclamation point. Now, understanding it's a hot button issue in the country, um, I think that's a, 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 a from a, from the front line kind of observation that um, is, is interesting within the context of uh, everything that you've shared today. Um, so, uh, David, you actually took some questions in the in the Q and A, which is uh, uh, st st strong <laughs> to be doing while you're answering them. We are uh, out of time, and I want to thank our uh, audience participants for all the questions um, that you posed and that we were able to get to. And of course, uh, uh, thank you to you both for letting me letting me um, um, uh, ask you as we go. I'm going to turn it over to Megan to close us down, uh, and uh, appreciate everything from, from that we share today. Megan, Thanks, over to you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Megan Sweezy Fogarty, and I'm honored to serve as Stanford Senior Associate Vice President for Community Engagement and close today's program. I'm deeply appreciative of our faculty whose research focuses on the challenges we all face in our region, nation, and world. And I want to thank Dean Studdart and Associate Professor Rawson Slater for sharing your work with us today. We hope you'll stay involved with Stanford. As we announced, today's recording will be up in a couple weeks on the Continuing Studies website. Fall quarter is also a wonderful time to be on the Stanford campus. The students move in next week and you can start to feel the campus coming alive after the summer break. If you live or visit the Stanford area, I invite you to connect with us further. You can learn about events open to the public, many of which are now virtual at events.stanford.edu. In the coming weeks, we have family events happening at our free museums, a wonderful schedule of performing arts, 
amazing continuing studies courses that are now enrolling and fall athletics, including our opening game uh, for football this weekend. You can also enjoy the beauty of the Stanford campus by taking a walk at the Stanford Dish or viewing our outside public art. So thank you for participating in today's Discover Stanford for You. Please let us know your thoughts on today's event when you get the survey. And if we can provide any information, please reach out to me and Stanford University through community.stanford.edu. We look forward to connecting with you further as we all work towards a better future. Thank you and have a great day.